Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining this credit-focused podcast or a webinar. Uh, I am Scott Slayton, the Chief Market Strategist at Capital Creek Partners. I spent my 30-plus career in finance as a portfolio manager, an asset allocator, and a strategist. Capital Creek is a multifamily office with a demonstrated expertise in asset allocation and alternative assets. We manage money for ultra-high net worth families, as well as endowments and foundations. I'd like to thank KBRA for hosting the call today and taking care of the many logistics necessary to pull this off. A special thanks to Caitlin Fitzpatrick. And now I'd like to introduce my friend Van Hesser, who is a Senior Managing Director and Chief Credit Strategist at KBRA. Mr. Hesser has uh, over 30 years of experience in financial markets, most of it in credit. Van is the creator and host of KBRA's weekly podcast, Three Things in Credit. I highly recommend Three Things because it is concise, impactful, and timely. I never miss it. I think it's the best 10 minutes in podcast land. So with that, we'll begin our, uh, our questions here. We're going to focus on all things related to credit. And so my first question to Van is, what are the most important trends in the credit market now that investors really need to understand? Yeah, well, thank you, Scott. Um, thank you for uh, joining me today. Delighted to be here. Um, credit has been an, an interesting asset class um, that has really evolved, I think, over the last, uh, call it 10 to 15 years or so. Um, taking a step back, Investors, of course, buy bonds uh, for income and diversification. So the things that matter, of course, are going to be relative value, maybe an upside downside view as to how you think uh, bonds will perform uh, as we look ahead. No different from other risk assets. You know, from a micro standpoint, um, you know, we focus on um, obviously the strength of cash flow. So we we look at the strength of the business model or the pool of assets. We think about the appropriateness of the capital structure. Uh, a reminder, of course, since we are higher in the capital stack than stocks, so there's probably a greater weight placed on certainty of cash flows rather than growth of cash flows. But again, an awful lot of what drives uh, investor sentiment towards stock can drive investor sentiment towards credit. Um, so from a macro standpoint, we focus a lot on on macro or rather on recession probabilities, what that forward look um, feels like. The other thing that I think is really important for investors to understand, especially those who don't follow the credit markets um, day to day, is that there's been an awful lot of innovation and broadening of the market again over that last decade, 10 to 15 years or so, um, especially in the private part of markets, so private credit, which I'm sure we'll get into a bit, um, has really become a, a bona fide pillar of the financial system, in our opinion. And, and the growth in credit markets in general, really, there's been a broadening of markets. It used to be, you know, kind of an odd corner, especially if you were talking about high yield or emerging market debt. It was, you know, something off in the corner that would that uh, some dedicated money would would play for sure, but didn't have necessarily that uh, that broad investor interest. Um, as these markets have grown, and that includes every part of leverage finance, and as I mentioned, the private credit market, um, there's been a broadening out, which is really, I think, um, a good thing um, for markets. It creates a better shock absorber. Um, <clears throat> investors can you know, feel like oftentimes that they've got uh, a way out if they choose to play in the more liquid parts of the market. So Again, I think the markets have um, evolved very positively over the last 10 to 15 years and, and now is a, a bona fide um, asset class with many, many dimensions that it can appeal to a broad array of investors. Right. Thank you. Van, are we in a new credit cycle with gradually rising defaults, possibly lower recovery rates, and even eventually a rationing of credit like we've seen in prior cycles? Or yeah, I mean, it's a good core. it's a good question. I think we've kind of gone back to normal, right? But I think if for those of us of a certain vintage, we remember life before QE, and so we've had this, you know, ever since the GFC, you know, enormous distortions in markets, um, courtesy of the central banks. So I think again, as we go back to sort of normal, um, 
you know, we are slowing, but not slow economically. Back to potential, call it 2% growth. And what does that mean for, for credit? Well, from our perspective, it really is a new paradigm, right? And again, it's one we've seen before, but it's kind of a, a misty, faded memory at this point. <clears throat> but, you know, we investors now have to test their cash flows against not only higher interest rates and slower growth, but also higher costs, right, that are embedded out there. Think about the energy transition, security of everything, right? Cyber, supply chain, all of those kinds of things are going to be a bigger drag on cash flows than what we've seen in the past. We've got a more volatile geopolitical risk environment. It's always tough to invest around geopolitical events. You know, our view is that those tend not to uh, drive markets all that much unless, and it's a big unless, um, it starts to hit supply and demand. And of course, oil is the most important uh, and obvious uh, element there. Um, so again, you're you're seeing um, you know a higher cost of capital courtesy of those higher rates. So it's more difficult to produce an acceptable return today as it was a while ago. Um, and that I think is going to bring back capitalism's creative destruction, right? We've seen the growth of zombie companies um, proliferate through the QE period, as much as 20% of listed companies by some estimates, right, are zombie companies. I think in a higher cost of capital environment, you're going to start to see that begin to flush out. And I think we're in, we're in the midst of that now. It's not going to happen in one shock. It's not going to happen overnight. But over time, I think we're going to start to clean up this credit environment a bit. And ultimately, I think that's good for um, for the asset class. But we're you know, we've got some work to do between now and then. Dan, as, as an asset allocator into the credit space, it seems like a new credit fund is hitting my desk every every week, and they're all raising three to five billion dollars. There just seems to be a cascade of, of capital coming into private credit. So do you feel that a bubble is brewing in private credit, or is this more of just a, a slow motion market share transfer from banks to non-banks? And Really, what are the implications of this transition of, of credit from banks to private credit? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Scott. You know, anybody involved in credit is always aware of when there's something new that's sort of a shiny new thing that attracts a lot of money. Um, certainly, we've had a lot of money has poured into credit, as I mentioned, that innovation and broadening of the market. Uh, has really brought um, you know massive flows over the last several years, um, but there is one really important structural change here, and you talked about it. Um, you know, it you know post the GFC, really in 2013, when the regulators um, gave guidance to the banks to de-risk, right, push out the riskier parts of credit that they have lent to in the past. Um, so think about commercial real estate development. You can think about um, certainly leverage finance, all that was pushed out into markets. And I think it's one of the things, probably the, the single most important thing policymakers did post the GFC was to de-risk the banking system. If you think about how that can go wrong, um, remember that, that banks cede control of their decision-making to regulators in times of stress. And that that regulator banker relationship can be adversarial. In fact, probably is adversarial, uh, especially in times of stress. If you've got a dozen or so global banks that hold a lot of that risk, you can then see how um, a, a shock can become a crisis, right? That was the GFC. And so by moving a lot of this riskier lending, this really illiquid lending out into markets, into a thousand institutional investors around the world, this is really positive evolution uh, <clears throat> taking place in credit markets. Now, again, is it a bubble? Well, you know, we've, you know, when the economy has performed much better than expected, when the when the asset class has performed or risk assets have a real tailwind at their back, you get a lot of money that comes into again this this wide array of opportunity in credit. You know, are we going to? You know, are we going through an adjustment period or will there be an adjustment period, a shakeout of, of sorts? Well, some of that's going to depend on sort of the macro environment going forward. And as long as we believe that it's fairly constructive, we do. We're very much in the soft lending camp. 
we think a lot of this is going to shake out in a rather manageable kind of way. Clearly, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of money has come into the asset class. We'll watch how it sort of progresses. But again, a lot of this is just really um, coming out of the banks and finding, quite frankly, a much better home. Van, when you think about the higher capital requirements for banks and and tighter regulation, are they beginning to compete again with with the private credit uh, non-banks or are they just going to cede it to them? And I, I read this morning in a note from Apollo that private credit constituted 2% of the market in, in uh, 2003. Now it's about 6%. Where can we see these, where can we see this going to well into double digits in your opinion over the next few years? Yeah, I kind of think so. And, and again, I'd be the first one to say <clears throat> as a, um, career and recovering bank analysts that, you know, the times, all the times the banks have been written off for dead. Uh, if I had a nickel for every time that was the case, uh, I'd be a wealthy man. So um, I think the banks <clears throat> have new competition, right? Um, complicated, right? By what you mentioned with higher capital standards. Now, every dollar of risk weighted asset has to be viewed really critically. Um, for what is what is the optimal thing to do with my relationship? Am I going to lend, hold on balance sheet? Am I going to lend to distribute? I think in general, the large banks in particular have the relationships and have a whole suite of fee-based products that they would love to deliver into that relationship. The more natural holder in many instances just might be um, someone out in markets, right? So to distribute that risk, um, might make the most economic sense for banks. Now, again, banks have big balance sheets. They're going to continue to use lending um, as a weapon, um, but it's going to be increasingly steered towards stronger credits, right? Back to that, you know, the guidance out of the regulators more than 10 years ago. So riskier lending for sure is going to be driven into markets. Um, and even, I think, over time, a lot of the investment grade risk that even the banks hold today might find a better place um, out there in markets. So it'd be very interesting to see how this, this plays out. The banks will be cagey about it and, and as always manage to that return on, on assets and equity, but holding those assets increasingly might be uneconomic for banks. Well, Van, you started your comments with the, comment about innovation. And it's really been incredible to me to see all the different forms of, of lending in the private credit markets, intellectual property, litigation, forward flows. Music royalties. Right. It, it, it's, it's, really, it's really incredible. And the opportunity set just seems to be growing and growing. You can, you can uh, you know, securitize almost anything these days, but when you're looking at, at the size of the credit markets and you think about the things that we're going to need to finance over the next five or 10 years, the energy transition, the defense buildup for the United States and probably all of the democratic countries, a reshoring of manufacturing and supply chains in the US, at least to a certain extent, infrastructure renewal, climate change, and, and this to say nothing of, of the voracious appetite that the U.S. government has for, I know that's financed in the treasury market, but it still is, has a potential crowding out effect. How are we going to finance all of these, these needs? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. Traditional credit or private credit? <clears throat> I think when you, when you, you know, phrase it that way, it's, it, it can be daunting. Um, I think, you know, I'm a big believer in U.S. Ex exceptionalism. I do think these are the most efficient capital markets in the world. Um, if the opportunity and the return is there, I have no hesitation in saying that that all of this can get financed. Um, you know, is there a crowding out issue? Um, a lot of our investors, uh, the folks we talk to, I think that camp is almost split. Those that worry about the deficits and those that don't. I tend toward... Uh, the camp that doesn't worry so much about the deficit. I think it can be managed. I think it's been done in the past. And quite frankly, you know, if there's a better alternative uh, 
than the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury market. I'd love to see it. But the reality is, as far as, I think as far as the eye can see, we don't see it. We don't expect it. And I think, again, this, <clears throat> this financing tab that's clearly out there has to be done, um, can get done efficiently over time, uh, you know, in U.S. markets. Well, sum it up. If there's a return, there's a way. Correct. Right? Well, in the spirit of a, of a two-way dialogue, I'll let you throw a couple my way. Sure. So, um, you know, given sort of the, the stage that we've set here, <clears throat> interesting that, you know, really long dated needs are, are finding their way in, in really efficiently these days into credit markets, clearly with the customers, the clients you serve. Uh, tell me how you think about the role of credit when you when you think about structuring portfolios in family offices. Sure. So I, I think credit plays a, a an important, if not vital role in conservative and moderate risk portfolio allocations for wealthy families. I mean, really wealthy families. Uh, they're interested in keeping their money and earning a return on their money and seeing it come back. And credit exposure provides both income and diversification, two very important things in asset allocation. And we think credit is especially value, valuable when yields are significant like they are today and equities are expensive, you know, historically expensive. And it reminds me a little bit of what, what Michael Milken said, you know, decades ago that if you can earn double digit returns in credit, why would you take on the risk of the equity market? That may be a little bit of an oversimplification, but I think credit is attractive now. Uh, we've been able to put together diversified portfolios of credit with private credit with what I think are excellent managers where we can create a, a yield, I think a, a, a fairly consistent and, and relatively safe yield 12 to, of 12 to 15 percent, which I think is very, very attractive. We're willing to give up some of the liquidity in order to do that. We feel like the, the juice really is worth the squeeze and in terms of sacrificing a little liquidity for a lot more yield than we're finding in public credit. So um, I think especially when you think about endowments and foundations that are non-taxable entities, credit just makes tremendous sense. And uh, when I was working in asset allocation over at Utemco, the nation's largest public endowment, uh, we had a healthy thirst for credit for just those reasons. So I think the asset class is very important, a well-diversified portfolio of, of credit risk that can earn double digit returns is super attractive in today's world where it seems like everything is rich, everything is expensive, and who knows what will come along to compress valuation. Certainly something will, it's just a matter of time, but we kind of like the, the haven of credit at this point in time. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that haven for a second, Scott. So, you know, I, one of the questions that I got recently, which admittedly I was a bit flummoxed in thinking through, and I want to, you know, tap into your experience and wisdom from a macro standpoint. If you take out the COVID shock, right? Prior to that, of course, we were at the longest economic expansion, peacetime economic expansion in U.S. history. Take out that COVID shock, it is extended by another five or six years. And if I look at the Fed's forecast or private sector forecasts, broad consensus now that soft landing is in the offering here. You know, to what do you attribute, attribute the, uh, you know, this, this U.S. expansion? We think about credit. We got to always think about the downside, recession probabilities. What could upset the apple cart? What do you think about, you know, are you concerned that you're theoretically at the top of the cycle here being swept in with an awful lot of other uh, investors in, in credit. How do you think about the future and what kind of vulnerabilities lie out there? What are the risks that you see? Well, Ben, we, we keep what we call a cycle monitor where we, where we track all kinds of economic data and market-based indicators. And when we look at that, it really tells us that we are late cycle, but you and I have had the luxury of, of 35 years in the markets. And we know that cycles often are extended much longer than any of us expect. So thinking 
about the long cycle that arguably began after the, the GFC, call it 2009, 2010, equities bottomed in March of 2009, if memory serves me correctly. So that's a long expansion. I think that the COVID recession, as short as it was, was a meaningful, deep recession. And NBER has flagged it as a recession. And let's also not forget that the first two quarters of 2022 were also negative. Right. When the Fed really started to tighten and, and Russia invaded Ukraine, that combined for, I think, a very short, sharp recession. MBE has not tagged that as a recession, I think, because unemployment really never went up. And amazingly, in my view, the Fed was able to tighten 550 basis points. And so far, so good. I'd have to admit that I'm also in the soft landing camp like you. So I think the expansion is durable. Uh, the greatest risks to the current expansion, in my opinion, number one on my list would be a reacceleration in inflation. And I think that's just simply not in the cards for the next couple of quarters. But I do worry about it as we get deeper into 2025, because historically, there is a, a real precedence for second waves of inflation uh, across countries and across cycles. And even in the United States, you can go back to the 20s, the 40s, and the 70s. And when we had big bursts of inflation that got close to double digits, in all of those cases, you had a second wave that actually eclipsed the first wave. So it's not my central case, but I do worry about it in 2025 or 2026 that we'll get a renewed. And we know the, we know the structural factors are still out there for inflation. Tight labor markets, um, very tight housing markets, notwithstanding multifamily, but single family markets are still very tight. Uh, we know that we have deglobalization, so we no longer have uh, that as a tailwind. Um, those are just the energy transition, very expensive and inflationary. We know our fiscal deficits are totally out of control with no political will to do anything about it. And we know both presidential candidates could hardly care less about, about fiscal spending uh, control. So uh, these are the structural tailwinds for inflation that could somehow lead to a rebound. And if that happens, all bets are off because the Fed would have to go back to tightening again. Uh, financial market participants would have to completely restructure their portfolios. I think very few participants are positioned in any way for a rebound in inflation. So it would be very, very disruptive. The next thing I worry about, of course, is, is what I would call the, the worst geopolitical backdrop I've seen in my long career. We now have a group of countries, which I have, have called the sinkers, uh, China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia, C-I-N-K-R. And these sinkers want to sink the current world order that is run by the United States and the, and the Western European democracies, the, the old G7. And uh, because of that, we it's a very dangerous backdrop. We've got two major wars going on. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, I think these wars are expanding. And look, Israel and Iran are basically at war right now. Yep. The Russia-Ukraine war continues to expand. We've got North Korean soldiers fighting for Russia. This is, this is kind of a creeping bear market in geopolitics. And I wonder if we wake up someday and there's just a headline that the markets can't tolerate and have to impress valuation. Yeah. So those are my big two big risks. Yeah, we, I would concur with the resurgent inflation. You know, the one thing we think about, and I agree with all of those things from remilitarization, the cost of <clears throat> the energy transition, deficits, demographics, there's an awful lot of things that just point to a more of an embedded inflation component than we've thought through really in our careers. Um, offset by automation. I'm really curious about what automation means. And so if we think about, again, over the medium to longer term, structurally higher unemployment, right, should be probably part of this. And the skills mismatch as this world of ours uh, sort of moves very, very quickly. We're very conscious of that. Is it something we invest around today? Not so much, but I think over that intermediate term, I think you've got to be fairly cautious uh, around some of these bigger, bigger threats um, out there. 
And maybe what you're saying, Van, is that productivity is going to need to save us. For sure. High productivity growth will ameliorate some of these structural tailwinds for inflation. And, and I'm a believer in AI. I use it constantly, several times a day. Hopefully it's not going to eventually replace guys like us. But I see <laughs> huge productivity benefits from that. And who knows where that's going to go. The, the trend toward automating everything is, is, is a tidal wave leading to higher productivity. So that I think is part of what keeps me in the, the, the soft landing camp, the, the bullish on risk assets camp. Yeah. And again, bringing it back to credit for a second here, if we think about um, all of the debt that was used um, ironically to bail out the global economy post the GFC to uh, bolster uh, the economy against COVID, right? All that went to the public sector largely. Consumer and commercial balance sheets in the aggregate are in really good shape today. We do talk a lot about two economies, this bifurcation between the, the haves and the have-nots, the haves being wealthier households and larger companies, uh, the have-nots being less wealthy households and smaller companies. I think there is a real... Um, divergence there. When we think about credit, again, there's given the broad array of things you can do, um, you've got to be careful from our perspective in in uh, <clears throat> going down into weaker, um, smaller companies uh, and less wealthy households. That's where we are seeing some um, default dynamics that um, you'd expect at a turn in the cycle. The aggregate data still looks great because the haves dominate the have-nots and carry the data. But I think you've got to be really careful in looking into uh, sector or sub asset classes that might be dependent on uh, meaningful contribution from the have-nots. And they're out there for sure. Dan, you have a, a great vantage point from the perch at KBRA into not just private credit, but also public credit. And I want to ask you to, for a moment, to contrast public and private credit. Where is the opportunity today? And if you're investing in private credit, like some of our families do, uh, is the illiquidity premium juice worth the squeeze? For sure. I think one of the revelations in, in this, this evolution in credit markets, um, the, you know, the advent and explosion, really, of, of private credit is just a better match tenor wise for why you would invest. Granted, there are lots of uh, mandates out there that require liquidity. Um, and that's all part of the, the landscape for sure. But if you don't, um, you know, to pick, you know, 50 to 100 basis points, at least in investment grade, if not more, I think Jonathan Gray at BlackRock, I think came out and said, you know, in single A's, they're getting 180 basis points of pickup. Uh, going into the more illiquid uh, world of private credit. Um, if you're you know, down or out the risk spectrum, it's that much more. So it can be very compelling, I think, to go out the risk spectrum in terms of yield if you can, if you don't have that, that near-term liquidity need. You know, I think, uh, you know, Apollo in particular, other uh, private credit market participants do talk about the liquidity, quote unquote, even in the public market. And, you know, one of the things that I've witnessed through my career, if I go back 20 years, um, all the big desks at the big intermediaries would warehouse a lot of risk to make markets in public credit. And there was a high degree of perceived liquidity. Um, that's really changed over the last couple of decades, right? As the market, ironically, has grown very um, nicely over that time frame, the amount of capital committed to intermediating, to making markets, has shrunk. It kind of forms an X, right, on a uh, on a chart, and so um, that you know, perceived liquidity, even in what you'd think would be on the run investment grade bonds has gone down pretty significantly. And so again, it's not to say that there's not, you know, still market making out there, there is. And 
and you know the large liquid deals still trade you can still trade those around with confidence but you got to be careful when you you know label something liquid go try and get a bid for you know a a meaningful block of of investment grade public credit it might not be in the context you were hoping for it makes me wonder about the the etf products like lqd hyg where individual investors have put a lot of money and will demand someday instant liquidity and the underlying securities just aren't that liquid and i think that creates some some big time gap risk and frankly, buying opportunities, we saw that in, uh, in the pandemic, we saw some incredible gappy buying opportunities in, in uh, IG and high yield when, when that hit. Yeah, so I mean, that, it's another interesting sort of question. And I, I completely agree that um, you know, oftentimes shrewd asset managers will wait for some sort of dislocation in the market, some sort of shock. And again, credit markets compared to treasury markets or or even stocks, your ability to execute on the market or what you think is the market um, can be very fleeting uh, in in a dislocating market. Uh, I think you know the. I think it's something you've got to always keep in the back of your mind as you as you think about this, because again, those kinds of that kind of liquidity that you might expect just might not be there. And as a, as a multifamily office that thinks a lot about credit, we have found several counterparties that have offerings that are tailored specifically to this. If, if there is short-term distress or even long-term distress, they are positioned to jump in and take advantage of those dislocations caused by illiquidity in the public markets. Yeah, so I, again, I, I do think that we think about the positive evolution of private credit. There is a, it, it serves as a much mm -hmm. better shock absorber. I think folks can pretty understand we, we talk about, you know, the, 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 the shift when you had a lot of risk concentrated in the big banks, all of a sudden you've got a problem. Regulators are now in control of, of markets. And you used to see big drop-offs in prices in, and markets would seize up. I do think now you've got, with so much of that risk pushed out into markets, it's a much better shock absorber. So I feel from a macro standpoint that the financial system really is in a better spot because of the, the growth of, of private capital both probably uh, credit and equities. Um, and so you're going to get, I think you're, you know, those those times of, of real dislocation in markets uh, have probably become, are going to be fewer and further between. It doesn't mean, however, that still these markets, especially when you get out into some of the more esoteric corners of the market, um, that's where these markets are still inefficient. And that can be obviously depending on how or, and how you pick your way around those opportunities can be a real plus, a great buying opportunity. Can also be you know a tricky place to uh, to be if you're not all that familiar with and, and and if you mismanage your expectations about what being in an inefficient market really really is going to look like. So Van, we sit here. Uh, exactly two weeks away from the elections. And uh, last week, I, I wrote a, a research paper about elections and their impact on the equity market. My conclusion was that elections really, U.S. elections don't really matter very much for, for equity investors and, and treasury investors. But I'm wondering, in your mind, is there any impact on the credit markets based on the coming election. Yeah, so if we think about, and, and I would agree with your view that history tells us that there really isn't. It can be oftentimes a fairly constructive backdrop. Maybe it's just change that people rally around. Maybe it's just the uncertainty gets squeezed out of the market at that point. And so risk asset stock and credit have performed relatively well throughout time um, post-election. This one, you know, I, I do think in a lot of ways is very consequential. <clears throat> there are things that that uh, I think investors are focused on, how, whether they act around it or not. You know, whether there's a Trump trade or a Harris trade, I'm not so sure, honestly, if we sort of peel a lot of this back, that there's any real evidence of that going in. 
to your earlier point, there's not a lot of fiscal discipline. It's not like we've got a black and white choice uh, this go around. Neither candidate seems to be talking much about uh, you know, fiscal discipline or reducing deficits. You know, I think markets in general um, respond favorably to gridlock, right? For all the reasons you can imagine, right? It, it sort of takes away the, the tail events, the worst instincts maybe of each party. And so I think if we get gridlock um, post November 5th, I think that allows markets just to sort of say, all right, that's now in the rear view mirror. This will work its way out over time. Any policy actions that we're really going to respond to are probably going to be, I don't know, six months to a year away. Let's just get back at it. Um, so I do think that markets would be most concerned or more concerned if we had a sweep, a red sweep or a blue sweep. Um, and maybe the blue sweep is is what might um, trigger more angst, especially in my market, if you think that at least historically, and, and again, we've talked about this in the past, but at least historically investors, especially bond investors, have been wary of a blue sweep, uh, thinking that there's going to be big government and big government spending and, and tax hikes that may or may not go through. Uh, it creates more uncertainty around that. But, uh, but you know, time will tell. Um, and, and again, I think a lot of this is going to play out over time. I don't think there's a whole lot to do in the immediate aftermath of uh, of the upcoming election. One thing that did come out in our study of elections was that for the treasury market, divided government really did result in lower lower yields. Not sharply lower, but meaningfully lower over over time. And I think that makes sense because it's just harder to pass profligate legislation, profligate spending legislation when you have divided government. So most of us are, are cheering for, <laughs> for divided government, but we'll, you tend to just get better legislation, more compromise, better legislation when both parties have to compromise. Yeah, I think that's right. And again, I think markets, especially the credit markets now, would love to see the rate cuts come through, would like to see rates come down, get a little price appreciation uh, in bond positions to go with their coupon clipping. So yeah, we're we're certainly paying close attention to what happens here. We know the history tells us maybe we don't have to worry that much. So Van, we, we know that uh, the Fed kicked off its easing campaign about a month ago with a 50, an aggressive 50. And now a month later, the markets are worried that they're not even gonna cut at all in November. <laughs> so, so assuming that we're on the path of an easing cycle that will have some duration to it, what is the, the impact on credit investors? Yeah, I think in investors have been waiting for a recalibration, if we use that term, right, of rates here, right? Clearly restrictive, uh, let's bring it back into normal, very unusual, right, to be easing into a, by all accounts, a pretty healthy economy. So it gets back to that, you know, should I be worried about resurgent inflation? Is this really the right thing to do? Am I going to be whipsawed here? Um, I think there is some conservatism out there in markets just because this is so unusual, right, to be seeing that. Um, yeah, we'd love to see you know, Fed funds down to 3% by the end of 2025. I think markets are probably at now 3.5%. That's come up, obviously, 50 basis points over the last month or so. Um, and to your point, I think now, you know, that with each data release that comes through, that's relatively hot markets, market angst um, goes up. I still think if we take a step back and, yeah, we're going to have the odd for sure um, data release that's going to get markets atten attention. And if you're trading, obviously that can, you know, <laughs> give you a little bit of heartburn to say the least. But if we take a step back and think about the path of inflation, we feel very comfortable that we are, we will continue to move towards target. Do we get to 2% by the end of 25? I think that would be careful what you wish for. If that is the case, we probably got some softening, more softening than expected. But I think we're we're going to stay on that path, which is going to give the Fed confidence that it's doing the right thing and continuing to uh, 
recalibrate those rates into a less restrictive position. So our view, 25 basis point cuts in November, December, take it as it comes over the course of 2025. Hate to say being data dependent. I'm not sure what the alternative is, but uh, but uh, assuming that the data is going to continue to come through in a relatively healthy, constructive way, I think that's going to dictate just how aggressively the Fed sort of moves. But I think we're, you know, we're we're clearly um, on the right path. I think economic growth, corporate earnings, um, all seem to be relatively constructive. Doesn't have to be growth. I'll let you figure out from a equity perspective is. As to whether or not when you buy stocks at these multiples, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, we, we talk about credit being at times good enough for credit. And I think this environment feels good enough for credit really well out the credit curve and gives us a lot of confidence that this is, again, back to that that certainty of cash flows dynamic that we focus a lot on. We feel pretty good about where we sit today from that perspective. Excellent. Well, we're... We're 43 minutes into this. I think we've had a wide ranging and robust discussion. And now it's it's time to take a couple of questions from the audience. So, Caitlin. Yes. Give um, us a couple from the audience, please. Of course. Um, so we've received one so far. Um, is the reentrenchment in bank lending structural in nature and therefore here to stay? Yeah, I'll I'll take a crack at it, Scott. Um you know, we, we touched on it, I think, a little bit earlier. This has been, I think, the, you know, the banks are in a a period of of strategic adjustment. I mean, if you really go back 30 years with, with the first ball capital re regulations that came out, banks have had to think more critically, more strategically about the role they play in the financial system. Do you want to originate loans? Yes. Do you want to hold them? Big decision, right? As we talked earlier, I think the banks would love that the ideal relationship for many of their relationships could be all those fee-based services that are capital light, um, happy to originate the loans, take a fee for originating the loans because I've got that relationship or that market presence, uh, and then let's distribute that risk to its best natural holder over the long term. Um, so I think that to, to answer this question, banks and bank lending are going, to, they're, they're already much, lending is much less important to a US bank than is the case, say, to a European bank, a Japanese bank, a Chinese bank, which are all still sort of largely bank-based financial systems. In the US, it's the flip side of that. Um, but I think that the, the the importance of banks from a lending perspective um, is already fairly low within the broader context of lending in the U.S. and is likely to marginally grind lower as we go forward and more and more borrowers see viable opportunities and competitive opportunities and, and advantageous execution in markets away from banks. You might say from my vantage point, I've been watching the banks lose market share since the mid 70s. The trend really started around 1975 and they bled market share to non-bank participants for basically the last 50 years. So there's been an acceleration in this trend. And I think there's been, as we both said, tremendous innovation in credit. You know, lending is an activity that goes back thousands of years, literally thousands of years. But you, you get a lot of smart Americans to work on something where they can make a lot of money. They will be incredibly innovative. And I think that's exactly what's happened in credit. It just is. I attended uh, Fortress's credit conference last week, and I was just absolutely amazed at the many different flavors, durations, um, different kinds of credit that can be invested, that originated and invested in. Yeah, again, it's, it's that innovation we've talked about, Scott. I think it's a, it's such an important part. Uh, it's really changed the very nature of what the credit markets are compared to even probably 10 years ago coming out of the GFC. There is just so many more ways um, for astute managers to play and find yield and return in this asset class than, than was the case 
not that long ago. All right, Caitlin, do we have any others before we wrap up? We do, absolutely. Um, a few write-ins, actually. What is the quality of marks of distressed loans in private credit portfolios? How much risk does this pose to private credit returns over time? Yeah, so I'll 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 take a crack at it and ha happy to get your perspective on this, Scott. Um, you know, this is largely uh, a a market that is um, it doesn't have, say, the bank regulator standing over the shoulder and directing write downs in times of stress. Uh, so almost by its very nature, it's going to be, uh, you know, again, third parties are employed. Um, it, it's a it's an essential part of the process. There's also one of the real benefits, I think, of of private lenders is that they can work with borrowers uh, much more uh, in a collaborative way than is the case when that loan may have been sitting on a bank balance sheet. And again, you're not going to have a, a terribly meaningful discussion with your bank regulator about write downs. I think so almost by definition, you're going to get something that is probably more thoughtful. Um, it doesn't mean that it's universally regarded as so. There's, you know, in, in really, you know, idiosyncratic risks on individual borrowers, this is going to be a whole lot more art than science. Do I think it could rise to the level um, where it undermines the credibility of the asset class? I would say no. I think there's enough discipline uh, around um, this market. And uh, depending on where you are, if you're in a BDC, <clears throat> obviously you're in a you're in a public vehicle. There's more scrutiny there. Um, so I do think that there's a there's sufficient discipline here uh, across the the asset class. I think over time, you know, it's in the it's in private credit's best interest to continue to to uh, fortify the credibility of 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 the marking regime. Not a lot uh, to add there from my perspective, other than that, I think the current environment is defined is defined by a lack of distress. It really is, very, we're in a good economy that's growing. Uh, and so there is a lack of distress. And when it does really come in the next cycle, I think there's a whole lot of capital that is gonna be there to catch it. So I actually think there will be less distress in the next cycle, unless it's a truly long, deep grinding 1981, 82 style recession, which I doubt it will be. Policymakers have learned to move heaven and earth when we have economic downturns. And uh, I doubt we'll see the kind of distrust that we've seen in prior cycles. Wonderful. I think we've got time for one more, Caitlin. Exactly, yes, perfect. Any views on the increasing focus on retail investors for illiquid private credit? Additionally, how does the growth, growth of quote unquote evergreen semi-liquid vehicles impact private credit going forward? Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> what has private credit done? It's really tapped into long-term oriented investors, right? Pensions, endowments, insurance companies. With, with the right kinds of products. Um, it, it is now tapping into a retail investor market. Um, I think you always have to be careful when you tap into retail markets that those retail investors know what they're getting into. Obviously, this is a market that heretofore has been limited to um, sophisticated institutional investors. Um, I think that is an issue that the 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 uh, the industry, the private credit industry, has to continue to work on whether that's through disclosure, um, you know, better investor education. I think it's we're still in early days about how this is all going to play out. I think it does. It is an attractive asset class that should be part of any, you know, financial advisor's uh, toolkit. But I do think you've got to be careful uh, as this sector sort of unfolds that the risks are are communicated clearly to retail. And I think that that is, I know that's an issue that is on every private credit manager's mind that's going into these markets. 
Well, that's probably a good place for us to wrap up. And I just want to thank uh, the people who called in to participate in this. I want to thank my good friend, Van Hesser from KBRA. Caitlin, thank you for organizing it and dealing with all the logistics. And uh, we wish everyone a, a good end to the, to the uh, calendar year. And uh, we uh, will hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott.